Hello, everyone. I'm Evo Dalder, President of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, and this is World Review, our weekly look at news from around the world. It is Friday, April 14th, and here are the big stories we're going to take a look at. Jamil Anderlini, who joined us, uh, joins us today, had a blockbuster of a scoop interview with Francois, uh, with Francois, with uh, Emmanuel Macron. Uh, on his way back from a visit with Xi Jinping, in which he sounded off on not China, but the United States. Then we'll take a look at all these leaks uh, of intelligence documents that are painting a complicated but interesting picture about where you as intelligence thinks the Ukrainian war stands when it comes to Russian forces and Ukrainian forces. And finally, this is Global Economy Week in, in Washington with the annual, uh, the spring meeting of the IMF and the World Bank. And we'll take a look at the state of the global economy and what it means for all of us. Here to discuss all of these issues is, as I said, Jamil Anderlini, the editor-in-chief of Political Europe. Jamil, great to have you back and congrats on the piece. Thanks, Eva. Also with us is Elise, Elise Labbitt, who is a, the founder of Zivi Media and a contributing editor to Political Magazine. Good Elise, to be with great you. to see you. And Ryan Heath, he is the author of Global Insider Newsletter, also of Politico, uh, and soon with Axios. But before that, let's turn, Jamil, to you uh, and the interview. You were on the plane that took off from Beijing on its way to Paris. Uh, not the journalist campaign, but the plane, but the real uh, plane interviewing the French president after three remarkable days that he had spent in in uh, um, in China. Uh, paint the scene for us uh, of the interview and and you know how you what of course uh, 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 Macron said, but also how you uh, reacted when uh, this was going on. Yeah, sure. So um, as you know, Ivo, I lived in China for 22 years and 11 of those years I actually lived in Beijing. So it was a surreal experience uh, to, to land in Beijing uh, last uh, Wednesday afternoon. We, we left sort of 10 p.m. from Paris uh, on Cotam Unité, which is the France's Air Force One. Uh, pretty nice plane. Um, uh, Macron, very charming guy, gets, when you get on the plane, you get seated and he comes down every time we took off. We took off, I think, three times with him, uh, four times. And he, he each time came down the plane, greeted every single person, very charming, very, uh, seductive as his, as his own, uh, handlers put it. Um, uh, but to be in back in Beijing in, in a very different context was, was absolutely fascinating. I used to be so upset when I lived there whenever a head of state from outside would come or when Xi Jinping decided to go anywhere because they block all the roads and, and they block these eight, you know, eight, six lane, four lane, five lane highways. Uh, so this head of state with the police convoy can go through. And that means the whole city basically shuts down for that. You know, while you, but when you're inside the bubble, you can experience China with no traffic. And I have to say, I'm a, I'm a convert. If, as long as I'm on that side of the, the, the traffic, um, I'm, I'm kind of into it. Um, look, it was the, the interview was, um, after we'd been in Beijing, after all the very ceremonial parts of the, the, the state visit, um, we did the interview on the plane from Beijing to Guangzhou. It's about a three and a half hour, three, three and a half hour flight. That's when we did the, the, uh, formal interview. It was, uh, myself and two French journalists. And, um, he was, uh, it was partly in French when he was uh, answering questions to the French journalists, uh, but I was recording it. My colleague, uh, I shared the recording with my colleague afterwards. I don't speak French. I speak Chinese. Um, but I did my parts of the interview in English. Um, it was absolutely fascinating. I, I think he, he, spoke, he spoke very frankly, um, and he said things that I wasn't expecting him to say, like, we need to not follow America. We can't be vassals of America. And to use the term vassals when you're literally, you've just spent sort of three hours, four hours with Xi Jinping in China, when it's a very sort of China-associated word, is, is very uh, uh, strong language, let's say. And, and then he basically proceeded to say that Taiwan is not the problem of Europe. And it's, you know, the Americans are the ones pushing China. A bit like how, if you look at what he said about Russia and Ukraine, particularly before the elect before the invasion, Russia's invasion, it's like it's America that is pushing Russia to invade Ukraine. Like he he seems to 
really, I, I guess, sort of believe this idea that America in many ways is the problem in the world and that what France needs to do in particular, but Europe in general, is is distance itself from, from the US. And, and there's a willing audience in this part of the world, I would say, that, that quite uh, agrees with that. And um, it was fascinating. And it obviously caused um, many parts of Eastern Europe in particular, but uh, here in the European Union, they would say that Macron is not speaking for, for the rest of Europe. And obviously in Washington, between clenched teeth, they said, oh, he can say what he wants and we have a great relationship. But it was just met with absolute fury, I think, in many parts of the American establishment. Like, hey, we are protecting you in Ukraine, effectively. We are funding the war in Ukraine. You are not really contributing. And then you're saying, let's be, let's be uh, you know, distant from America. So it was an absolutely fascinating trip and a fascinating interview. Um, I have to mention that um, on the way back from, he then spent uh, three more hours with Xi Jinping, half of that time with his advisors and half the time with no advisors. And I think that's very, very interesting because um, we don't really know what happened. Uh, him and the translators and Xi Jinping know what happened and, and all of the Chinese state security apparatus know what happened in, in, that, um, in those meetings. And then he did speak to us again uh, off the record for about half an hour just before we landed back in Paris. And uh, it was off the record, but all I would say is that he was not backing away from interpret this. Is this really what he believes, or do you think he is three? He was so charmed after three uh, days that he forgot what his own uh, talking points were. Well, I think it's a little bit of both, and I think he ha even himself has kind of competing narratives here. And when you look at what his his words are, but you look at what his actions, I mean, you think maybe he was just trying to be very forward leaning. First of all, you know what. And the, another question is, is this what he thinks or is this what Europe thinks? And it's pretty clear, you know, he took the head of the European Commission and, in fact, is, insisted on doing that with him, um, who took a little bit of a, of a, you know, harsher line on Taiwan, on, you know, China's, um, let's say, behavior in the region um, than he did. So we had a little bit of a good cop, bad cop. And then right after the visit, um, China, you know, because of what's going on with, you know, the, the Chinese, the Taiwanese president um, going through the United States and meeting with uh, House Speaker um, Kevin McCarthy, among others, um, did some, you know, drills right around, you know, Taiwan's coast. And French, France did supply a frigate to go through there um, in response to that. So that's Macron's answer that no, you know, policy is very consistent um and you know, we're a close uh, ally of the united states but at the same time a quick um, point on clearly that just this plays into a larger narrative that macron has about Euro european autonomy that they that europe needs to be separate from the united states a lot of people in europe do think and i'd love to know what jamil and, and ryan think that you know a stronger china perhaps even a regional hegemon would be better for europe because it weakens the United States and maybe makes Europe a greater kind of player in world politics. And so you have a lot of things going on there. But, you know, what Macron did, um, and you pretty much heard a, a very um, negative reaction in Europe, which it, you know, kind of divided Europe a little bit and made Europe seem like it doesn't have a seamless unified policy on Taiwan and China. And it also sought and, you know, in some ways successfully to peel Europe away from America and make it look like, you know, this is America running, you know, uh, wild on its own. And you kind of saw that when Biden came in, when they had that first NATO meeting, there was a very strong U.S. effort um, to make China the, the big, uh, you know, the worst player on the world stage. And the Europeans were like, wait a minute, you know, we have a lot of business with China. We don't want to pick a war with China. You know, so so the U.S. And, and Europe have trying to be kind of coming together a little bit more. But Macron's um, comments really were not helpful in that regard. Just a very tiny point. Uh, well, not so tiny point. Um, the frigate that Macron was referring to, I believe, went through the strait like three months ago. So he ah. was like, he was saying like, oh, and we once sent a frigate through there. Oh, we so once how sent we... it. Yeah, 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 it was yeah. definitely not like in reaction to the, because they were playing that up when I was on the bus with his top advisors and his ministers okay. and all My the rest. Bad. They're like, oh, but we once sent a frigate through there, but we're not going to do it again because it was really annoying, uh, annoyed them. And like, so, so I think, 
he was he mentioned it as a sort of like but look we're quite tough too but it was just you know uh, yeah it, it's kind of ridiculous but it's pretty sense. i mean it's pretty clear that you know no matter what he says about you know the U, the Euro european policy hasn't changed europe doesn't really have a unified policy it, you know um on taiwan certainly from the french point of view um they don't they don't want i i think they do see china's growing rise as a threat but not as big of a strategic competition on the world as the u.s does right? ryan yeah i mean to pick up that point because it, it, in part it may be and, and this is what i told a a senior u.s official who who um who commented uh, on this and i said well maybe Macron did all of us a favor uh in the sense that the outrage in europe was complete uh, from Germany to uh, to Lithuania and everywhere in between saying, well, that's not our policy. We're much closer to von der Leyen. Uh, and it sort of uh, isolated Macron, which who has been in many ways the least cooperative on China policy in NATO and EU and everything else. Uh, may this be turn out to be a good thing uh, from a U.S. perspective or a perspective of having Europe with a more singular policy, maybe with France being France, which is, you know, that we live with that since 19. Sorry, Ryan, what do you think? Yeah. Can I just I one last data point? Yeah, Very last. Yeah. Sorry, Ryan. Very no, no, fine. Uh, the great irony here is that France is the only European country that sells weapons to Taiwan. And so they want their cake and eat it too. And then, like, but no, but we're like going to hand you over to. Anyways, go, Ryan. Sorry. <laughs> but that's not a, none of that's a problem. Several things can be true at once. Like, my view on this is it was ultimately a strategic error because it was giving China what it wanted from this trip. But it just reflected a bunch of essential truths at the same time. He's kind of acting like a weird human chat GPT here. He's just giving us this rapid fire, everything everywhere, all at once mirror of ourselves. So firstly, on that front, uh, the division between he and Ursula von der Leyen, that just reflects the reality of power in Europe, it was like nice and progress that the two of them were there together. But these big member states are never going to give up their power fully to the EU. So Ursula was never going to have equal or top billing in this situation. And then secondly, like if you think through what Europe's relationship to China is, Europe's not capable of going to war with anyone in general. We already see that from Ukraine. And the US is the only power capable of actually being in a full-on war or full-on strategic competition with China. And so that both explains why Europe has a slightly different approach to all of these questions. But if Europe cannot get its act together and get Ukraine across the line in its war, it cannot be useful to anyone in Taiwan. And that's just fundamentally true. And it's really annoying for a lot of people to have to be confronted with that rather than glide across the top of it. But in a way, that's all Macron is doing in the same way that he called NATO brain dead. Um, it's not because he didn't want NATO to exist. It's he was making us confront something we don't like about ourselves. Uh, no, I think uh, uh, everything can be true at the same time. And and this will sort out. I, I, and I think uh, Macron has made the case. I am a head of state and Ursula von der Leyen is the head of, a, of an institution. Uh, I think it, it's unfortunate that this keeps on happening, uh, particularly with her. And but particularly Chase, since, I mean, uh, so calm down. Like, this is progress. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is. I, I mean, particularly. But the other thing that I think is interesting is, of course, she delivered a major speech on China policy just before setting off for Beijing, which, yeah. you know, in all, uh, if you read it carefully, uh, could have been written by the White House as opposed to uh, by folks in Brussels. And and then to have the next major statement, including the, the Chinese French statement, which had all the Chinese buzzword language uh, in it as well, uh, come out uh, is is remarkable. And then finally, this was supposed to be a trip that got she in order, you know, she was going to solve the Ukraine problem. Whatever happened to that? Uh, you know, uh, that, uh, you know, we, we, he, as Macron said, he was going to bring, she was going to have to bring Russia to its senses. Well, a big fat no on that one. Well, uh, I mean, he is to your funding question. Ukraine at the IMF. But <laughs> Everyone <laughs> missed Eva, that to one. Your, to your question yeah. about, like, whether this, you know, was just... Um, Macron going there and, you know, being so enamored with Xi, we both know that, all know that those um, statements are kind of cooked in advance. So he did kind of go there with that, you know, 
effort to make this rosy statement in mind. And I just think, you know, it shows that, you know, the, the transatlantic alliance is not on the same page on, on China. I mean, there may be shades of gray within all of them, but I mean, clearly, um, you know, France is, you know, and, and France is one of the most powerful. And you also had the chancellor of Germany go there and, you know, they're not synced up with the United States. And Jamil, you made an interesting point at the end of the article, which I'd love to, if you could tease that out a little bit, that, um, you know, in his comments that the French, you know, that there was this um, whole thing that the French wanted to proofread the interview and cut some things out, that he was much more forward leaning even than he was in that very forward leaning argument. So I'd love if you could tease out just a little bit of, you know, where you think Macron is on this. Yeah, well, I can't under the terms of <laughs> what I agreed uh, go into what else he said. Um, but uh, I thought it was important that we that we um, that we acknowledged the fact that uh, in order for us to for me to go on the trip and to uh, and, and to conduct the interview, I had to agree to these terms, which are, which as uh, you know, free press, we don't normally agree to and wouldn't agree to. Um, uh, we did because I thought the value of the interview was was Absolutely. very very high, and in fact, at the very um, th those conditions that they tried to impose that they did impose uh, were only imposed just before we were about to take off, and they basically they presented it as an ultimatum: either you go on the trip and agree to these conditions, or you can't come on the trip at all. So they there was a sort of game playing by by the the French president's office, um, which uh, so look he he was as we alluded to uh, he was more forthright on this topic so um it, it seemed to me that macron has a history is from what i understand of saying things like nato is brain dead or um he, we should just uh, look after vladimir putin's feelings or whatever the things he said he, he he tends to make headlines for the wrong reasons after particularly after trips overseas and in interviews with foreign press, which is why I think his own advisors are very worried about what he's going to say, because he talks quite freely. He talks sort of, you know, in a, uh, like a professor almost. He talks in these sort of grand, like strategic, well, you know, there are these. Yeah. And um, I would say, though, that my impression was he believes this. He believes that China is rising, America is maybe declining, and that Europe needs to stand apart from from both and and play somewhere in between. Um, and that that's in the interests of France for sure, especially with the UK no longer part of the European Union, that Europe should be a third superpower with France as the leader. I mean, that's basically his his viewpoint. And um, and that the relationship with China is a way for him to achieve that. And um, I think he he didn't misspeak. I'm sure I'm sure he didn't misspeak. I know he didn't misspeak because I uh to spend a lot of time with him and this uh yeah this was what he thinks and i think it's a problem for the us um i would say if i'm if i'm looking at very very um uh dispassionately and from the outside i think number one that most people in europe and probably even in the white house think it's a good thing that somebody is talking to china right now the us can't really talk to china most western countries are not in a position to talk to china so the french president has a kind of unique uh, uh, position to be able to do that at the moment. Um, so I think in general, there was like, that's a good thing. Um, I think also that if France and others were to kind of give the impression that they are solidly in America's camp, then I think we are entering a very, very dangerous period in in world history. And what Macron likes to say, this block on block uh, uh, conflict. And I think I agree with him, frankly, that that is extremely dangerous. If you have China, Russia, Iran lining up against, you know, America, Europe, you know, Western democracies, maybe Japan, Korea, I think that is we're headed into, you know, really serious world conflict. And so from that perspective, I think he has quite a point. And I think many in Europe actually would grudgingly or not so grudgingly think that he, he has a point there. But he yeah, does no, talk like that, a professor, which is fascinating. Yeah, he yeah, talks no, like no, a, I think that's, an international relations professor. Um, so. Well, we we had a president like that. His name was Barack Obama, uh, who did uh, did exactly the same thing. Could speak in paragraphs uh, to explain uh, to to explain things, but usually wasn't. It was more careful of what he said uh, than uh, than Professor Macron. 
Um, uh, speaking about speaking our mind, Elise, and this maybe is a good, uh, a, a good segue to, to the intelligence leak. Uh, one of the things about leaks is you get to see what people are really saying, and in this case, intelligence analysts saying about what they think that is happening in ways that are generally not supposed to end up in on social media, let alone on the front pages of newspapers. Uh, and we got a glimpse of this uh, in the last few uh, a few days. Uh, with a series of leaks that uh, seem to have uh, come through a great gaming site. And we have a, uh, a Air Force National Guardsman who's just been uh, arraigned in front of uh, federal court uh, for um, being accused of leaking uh, uh, this, this stuff. But we, we've, we've got some uh, interesting uh, perspectives, uh, true or not, which, you know, none of us can really comment on, but it seems to be uh, official real documents and no one has denied it uh, that they are. Uh, to give a, a sense of where uh, uh, the U.S. thinks its allies are, uh, but in particularly, this is uh, mostly about Ukraine and Russia. Uh, those two uh, countries are. So help us understand what, what happened. How did these documents get on uh, into uh, the Washington Post and the New York Times and every other newspaper? And, and what did they really mean? Um, well, it's interesting. You talk about, you know, that that leaks provide um, an assessment of thinking, but they don't necessarily... Um, provide an answer as to why they were leaked. And there have been all these kind of, um, you know, allegories and metaphors um, about, you know, spies and quoting T.S. Eliot poems. So we, wh why were they leaked? We'll get to that in a little bit. But this is, you know, as you said, this uh, National Guardsman from Massachusetts was um, arrested for leaking these documents to a Discord channel. He had this group of, you know, like-minded um, patriots, um, very pro gun. Um, you know, what that's not here nor there, but really felt, you know, it was a very tight knit group. And we don't know why he leaked it, but, you know, the Washington Post had some really good reporting about, you know, this community and, um, and who he was leaking to. Um, but, you know, th among other things, you know, there were a lot of documents about how the U.S. is spying on some allies and some other things about South Korea and Israel. But but what's really kind of, you know, top of mind is that that the documents were leaked um, about extensive details about the war in Ukraine and U.S. assessments of it. Um, they give a real view into um, Ukraine's military capabilities, its shortcomings. Um, in, in advance of this planned counteroffensive for the spring. And it shows that Ukraine is facing a severe shortage of air defensive weapons, um, you know, in, and it could run out maybe by May. Um, they fired a lot of missiles to hold off um, to save the power grid in October and kept that, that running, but it severely depleted its air defense capabilities. And so now the United States is trying to rush um, air capabilities to them. It also showed um, that, you know, basically the, you know, ammunition is not getting to the Ukrainians fast enough. And it also kind of shows a reluctance from the U.S. in terms of drones and intel assets and shows, you know, a little bit of reluctance on the part of the United States um, to be more bold in terms of poking Russia. On the other side, it also shows that Russia's elite forces were depleted early on in the war, and it kind of jumped the shark in terms of using them early, and that could be a vulnerability um, for Russia going forward in the war. So, uh, you know, again, we have to go back to why these documents were leaked. Did this National Air Guardsman have some motivation in mind? Um, you know, like I said, there was this... Um, kind of comparison to the T.S. Eliot poem, Wilderness of Mirrors. There's a lot of smoke and mirrors going on, and we really don't know why. But Syria, it does, you know, and also the documents are a little bit dated. So, you know, military officials and Ukrainians don't know that it would necessarily kind of affect the battlefield um, precisely. But there is a con with in terms of both. Uh, what it means in terms of allies in the United States having this kind of information. And again and again, WikiLeaks, Snowden, uh, U.S. Uh, information getting out. But also, uh, what, it what does it tell you about uh, the state of the war? I think it tells me, well, it 
it highlights to a wider audience something that kind of insiders like us might know but never sort of have the means or the reason to share through reporting about the way classified information uh, is made available within government and military systems. People would be surprised to know how many people have access to it, how junior some of those people are. I've, I've never served in the military, but I was a 24-year-old foreigner working for the British government who had access to some things I probably don't really think I should have had access to in terms of personal details of very important people, um, being in rooms with uh, the equivalent of the National Security Advisor and being in discussions that probably 24-year-olds of any kind and certainly 24-year-old foreigners shouldn't be involved in. So it doesn't shock me that a 21-year-old would have access to some of this, but it does highlight some systemic issues that probably need to be addressed. And then in terms of the war itself, I think it's just a real meta point. Elise described this very well, so I don't have a lot to add, which is that you have to give more and constantly if you want Ukraine to be able to win this. Now, very clearly, there are nuclear considerations at the US end, which is a little bit different to how do you manage migrants flooding into Poland? Like they're two different questions. But any suggestion that you can turn off the money taps or that you could do a pause or going smaller is better than going bigger. Like none of that is true when it comes to helping Ukraine finally get across the line here. And and I think everything that we learned this week just reinforces that point. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's certainly right. And but there is this fear of escalation. And I think having people in the White House who actually worry about that is, is not necessarily a bad thing. Yeah, that's a good thing. Too. Um, uh, when you when you have that, Jamil, what, what what's been the reaction in Europe? Is and in, in both in terms of the leak, uh, in, in the leaks, I, I guess, in and of itself, and what it tells about the trustworthiness of uh, of uh, the ally on which they they were they depend on their security, but also in terms of. The picture that is being uh, painted is uh, of the, the the likely balance of power and the conflict uh, and its evolution over time. Is it pretty much the same uh, perspective as as we see in these uh, uh, these documents, or is there a difference? As there was, for example, prior to uh, the actual invasion occurring, when the U.S. was sharing intelligence, and there was serious doubts in certain European countries uh, about the veracity of that intelligence. Yeah, I mean, lots of jokes about how uh, the US spied on Angela Merkel and spied on its allies, and there's been a bit of, bit of the the sort of uh, rehashing of of some of the uh, reaction when the Edward, Edward Snowden revelations came out. Um, also, a bit of uh, you know damage control. The French um, government had to. Um, deny that uh, French special forces were operating in Ukraine. Some of these documents have shown that uh, some of the uh, that, that some special forces for, special forces of some countries have actually been operating inside the borders of Ukraine, which uh, we here at Politico suspected. We did a bit of reporting on. We couldn't quite earlier in the uh, uh, earlier in the conflict. We couldn't quite nail it. It was quite hard to to stand up the that but we were sure it was happening um from our perspective there's been uh some vindication on some of the reporting again was as reporters as you know my colleagues know and you all know that um you you often get bits of information and you're often working to confirm it you're trying to stand it up um and sometimes you just don't meet that threshold especially when you're talking about things to do with national intelligence because obviously people just they, you know, governments don't want to tell you if it's a if it's a secret. So, uh, one particular story we were very close um, a couple of weeks ago to to reporting that China was already supplying uh, weapons to um, to Russia and disguising those those uh, supplies. Um, and we came so close here, and uh, the some of that. Um, uh, some of the leaks now confirm that uh, that the top levels of the Chinese military did approve the the um, transfer of weapons to Russia. And I just went to see an official here who I had gone to see a few weeks ago to say, can you tell me about this? And they say, denied it, denied it, denied it. I said, come on. And they're like, oh, yeah, well, I couldn't tell you, could I? And so, you know, there's a for us journalists, there's a bit of um, vindication on some of the reporting, a bit of annoyance that we didn't quite get some of these stories over the line. But um yeah, I mean, it's it's worrying for for um, 
well, particularly for allies that have assisted the United States. Well, um, and it brings back it brings back your point to the whole idea of that Macron was just in China talking about Ukraine and being all lovey dovey with the Chinese as they're aiding, you know, the Euro as they're aiding Russia in this against against France and and Europe as well. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, uh, yeah, crazy. it is. It, it's uh, it's complicated. I mean, if, I, I I do think uh, that no one is truly surprised that a major power like the United States actually would like to know what its allies think as much as what its adversaries think. Um, uh, the 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 obverse is of course true too. It's not try. It's not like the allies aren't trying to figure out what the Americans are trying to think. Ask uh, ask the Elysee. Um, uh, but yeah, it's, I think it's always embarrassing it when it comes out. Yes, yeah. Exactly. The, I think the concern is that yes. we're we're giving you intel, we're sharing stuff with you, and you and a twenty one year old gamer yeah. is leaking this to the Russians and to the whole world, right? I mean, that's the thing that I think. Um, you know, why should we ever help the American? And this is the. I'm not saying me. I'm saying right, that right. Uh, this will be the uh, the the um, some of the discussion I know that is happening here is like, man, if they can't even keep this stuff secret, like how can we cooperate and be helpful in the future if it's all going to come up? So. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's a problem. It's a big problem. And, and, um, you know, you would have thought that after Snowden, they had, uh, put into place, uh, the kinds of, uh, structures that would have prevented this kind of leak because it is about if the leak, if it turns out that this is the way it was leaked for, you know, showing off to your buddies on Discord uh, what you really know. Um, that's 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 very. What? Uh, but uh, was it just showing off though? We well, really that's don't. That's the question, right? We that's really don't know. Did he no. have some ulterior motive in mind? I mean, you know, some of these analysts that are saying like it doesn't seem to necessarily be a malevolent person, but maybe he had some strategic. I mean, we're we're appointing some strategic uh, mind to him that we don't know that he has, right. but. And we do, um, and, we, and we do know that the that at least someone doctored the documents uh, uh, in order to and then flush them out. And in fact, that's how we found out. The first was that there were two sets of, uh, of documents with casualty numbers uh, uh, flipped uh, uh, by uh, by someone who wanted the casualty numbers for the Russians to be reduced and the Ukrainians to be uh, increased. Whoever that might have been, um, we can all we can all uh, have our own opinion or guesses on. Um, uh, we'll, we'll we'll learn more about the story, and certainly the Ukraine story won't go away, uh, nor the, uh, the the difficulties between the United States and its allies when it comes to uh, intelligence and uh, and these kinds of conversations. But Ryan, in the meantime, uh, uh, the IMF and World Bank had their spring meeting in Washington, a very important set of meetings, and. Uh, uh, you know, at the at the point when I think the uncertainty about the state of the global economy is probably as high as it's ever been with the post COVID uncertainties, the supply chains, the trade disruptions, uh, and of course inflation continuing in major economies and uh, China emerging from uh, from its uh, COVID lockdown. Uh, what was the mood in Washington? You spent a lot of time talking to folks there, uh, in, including the head of the IMF and others. Uh, about where we are in terms of the economy and, and the worries and concerns that they uh, are expressing. Yeah, I think there's quite a bit of disjointedness, I would say. Not necessarily disunity, not blindness, but a little bit of people focused on different things and, and not feeling that they can juggle the full set of priorities together. So I unpack that a little bit. So I sat down with Kristalina Gorgieva for a curtain raiser interview and the headline numbers, maybe you've already come across them. Like it's clear that global growth is lower than it's been in, in 30 years. Uh, that there are some problems not fully understood in the banking system. And then it's also clear um, that more needs to be done on climate change. And I really don't think the two institutions and their members are getting their act together on the, on the climate change front. And Gorgieva had some very interesting things to say about the Chinese leadership as well. So I think like the key takeaway I had on the banks and the financial system um, was was when she said um, that she's more optimistic today than she was in 2008. Like we have fixed some things, but she said that there's simply no way interest rates can go up as quickly as they did after being as long as they did, um, as low as they were for so long for there to be no vulnerabilities. And her key phrase was something's going to go boom. And that could be a series of banks, but it also could be sovereign debt. 
and sitting down with Mia Motley, the, the Barbadian Prime Minister, yesterday in a small group, she was running through the numbers of how the interest rates on her loans from international institutions have gone up from 1% to 5% this year and 1% to 4% in a lot of things. And and she was just like, how can it be that like nothing has changed about my ability to deal with this, but I'm paying 400% more from institutions that are supposed to save me from going bankrupt like this is insane so it's a case of sort of left hand and right hand not talking to each other and she said it's not malicious people aren't trying to punish us because they think we've done something bad it's that they're just not thinking through the implications for countries like mine and then you extend it more broadly into the climate crisis and you and she says well look the world came up with the money it needed for covid trillions it came up with the money it needed to save banks in 2008 10 and other countries onwards trillions why can it not come up with the money for the global south to be able to mitigate climate change and to stop countries either going bankrupt or sinking like it just doesn't make any sense and she was explaining how she gets told um that she can't even talk at a lot of imf forums like she's a member of the imf and she's prevented from speaking at a lot of them uh in in her telling of it um and so that speaks to some problems that economists were outlining about the IMF. Now, they claimed it was an institution that was paralyzed and in an identity crisis. I think that went very far. But you have an institution that isn't able to fully join up with the World Bank or, or address this multi-crisis, let's say. But then one of the things, and my final point, was Gorgieva was very... Um, proud, like she didn't say it on stage, but she's very happy that everyone signed up to a new Ukraine um, funding package, including China. So in her view, China is helping Ukraine, whatever else it's doing with Russia to play both sides. That may help explain why she was so bullish on the new Chinese economic leadership. And she'd just come back, and I was her first interview after coming back and eyeballing all of them. And she said the new premier, um, she was very impressed by him in particular. She just described him oh as gosh. very approachable, yeah. very committed to China, opening up to foreign investors. And I can, I knew Jamil was going to do this. I said this so Jamil would be able to <laughs> jump in with his reaction. Um, and I was like, wow, that's very, um, very optimistic <laughs> based on one meeting with the new Chinese leadership. Jamil, I know the, I know the premier because uh, he was um, a small town mayor when I first met him. He was the governor of Zhejiang, probably the last time I met him. He, he is, I would, you know, I would say small town mayor is probably a relatively or medium sized city mayor is probably an apt description. When I saw him in uh, Beijing last week with Macron he, uh, in the sort of five, 10 minutes while we're there, let us be in the room before they kick us out for the real discussion. I think he mentioned, as Chairman Xi Jinping would say, 10 times and just that. And I asked people who were in the room for the whole time. And they said at least 50 times. So almost every sentence he prefaces with as Ch the great leader, Chairman Xi Jinping. I mean, he's there as he, he's not really the premier, as we've understood the premier of China for 30, 40 years, a person with autonomy who runs the government. Xi Jinping runs the party and is head of state as uh, as the chairman of the Communist Party and the the, the leader of the country and the military. But the, traditionally, the premier is supposed to oversee the economy and has a fair bit of autonomy and is supposed to just sort of keep that going. And you've seen that with every premier going back. Li Keqiang, the last one, was distinct from Xi Jinping, but overshadowed. But this is just a yes man who uh, really has very limited experience on the economy. And I, I think it's very worrying to hear someone like the head of the IMF talking so glowingly about somebody who is obviously just a cipher. Um, and I would point out that um, the last person uh, in the Politburo, a person called Liu He, who was in charge of the financial sector, was a very well-respected globally, uh, le you know, thought leader, let's say, on on economics and on finance. And his replacement is the former head of the state planning agency, the uh, the NDRC. I mean, that just tells you everything you need to know that. Um, China's approach to the economy, the Communist Party's approach to the economy and to finance has gone back decades, I would say, in this last reshuffle. And it's, as I said, very worrying, but to be expected that the head of the IMF would be um, saying sycophantic things after one superficial meeting with the new team. That's what Elise. I'm I, I thought what was an, another interesting um, aspect of this very wide ranging interview, it was a great interview, Ryan, 
um, was that she talked about, you know, kind of despite, you know, that the worries about inflation and, and that, you know, many countries have, you know, made progress, as Janet Yellen said. I mean, this message was very kind of contrary to what, you know, the rosy picture that Janet Yellen is giving. But at the same time, I thought what was interesting is that she was ringing the warning bell about the impacts of the world kind of dividing geopolitically because of these frictions caused by the war in Ukraine, suspicions between the U.S. and China. And then you go back to Macron, you know, to kind of bring it full circle to Macron's comments. I mean, there is an economic, you know, it's important for the West to stand up for values, to fight against authoritarianism. But the more this kind of Cold War, whatever you want to call it, heats up between the U.S. and China, the more of a toll it's going to take on global economic growth. The longer that the Ukrainian, the war in Ukraine drags on, that impacts food prices. The longer, the more of a toll that's going to take on economic growth. Then you also have rising oil prices. Um, and so the loss of, you know, the increased food prices, the loss of trade, um, you know, you want to try and minimize that. And, and so, yes, I totally agree with Jamal and Ryan about, you know, that was a very rosy picture that she presented to the Chinese. But I do think, you know, multilateral institutions want the world to get along because when the world gets along, um, you know, the global economy is better. And so it's not just, it's obviously not black or white, um, but you can't, you know, there's a lot of, for instance, a lot of talk about decoupling between the US and China, which is like ridiculous. I mean, half of the things that we have in the United States, we don't have manufacturing for insulin, for instance. Um, you know, nobody who has diabetes is looking for decoupling with China because most of the insulin is produced there. So, so you know, th these have wider global impacts. And I think what she was trying to get at in that interview um, was that, you know, these frictions are not good for global growth as a whole. So, you know, you can have your strategic competition, you know, we have to fight for our values, but at the same time, we do need to find common ground um, on issues of joint, um, of mutual interest, specifically economically. And and as, as Ryan said about climate change, of which, you know, China is seen as a potential, as a potential, I say that in quotes, leader in that space. No, I think, I think, Alicia, you've, you've, you've painted exactly the problem that uh, a leader of a multi multinational, multilateral institution that has uh, all, at least for the last 30 years sort of managed a globalizing economy and helped to globalize is now confronted with the political reality that of, of political fragmentation um, in which political uh, and geopolitical forces are becoming at least as important, if not more important than economic and globalization forces, whether it's the war, or competition with uh, China or General Yellen arguing for friend shoring, uh, and this idea and, and better supply chains, et cetera. And this, this, it seems to me is the big debate, uh, coming up. And Ryan. And she's saying, like, it's okay. You know, I think the wider, um, and I'd love Ryan to jump in, like, you know, the multipolar world is fine. But if you have like various axes of, you know, various blocks and you have various different economies and you have, you know, various types of governmental you know, kind of systems, that's not good for the global economy. I'd, I'd love Ryan to weigh in. Ryan, yeah, it's, I mean, you get the last what word. Said, yeah, I wanted her to put a price tag on it. So I said, okay, like you, you allude to this being a multi-trillion dollar problem in your reports and in some of her sort of earlier comments. And I was like, okay, but like a trillion dollars, that's 1% of the global economy. Is that just the price you have to pay to defend a value system? And she didn't really want to take a, a complete answer. She was basically like what you were saying, Elise. She want, you want to minimize that friction as much as you can. And and, and that's obviously true. Um, but I, I do think you can't either burn the planet down or you can't burn democracy down um, for the sake of one or two percentage points of economic growth. And while it is no comfort to people in the poorest countries in the world and the global south, I think... The countries we live in are rich enough now that you can take this hit of one or two percent and it's never going to be pleasant for anyone but it is manageable if you want to protect these broader systems and i definitely think that's the zone where we're now moving into 
That'll be the debate going forward, no doubt. Uh, and here, uh, when the debate heats up, we'll be back here and we'll review to discuss all of these issues. I want to thank Ryan Heath, Jamil Anderlini, and Elise Labatt for excellent conversation across a wide range of issues. We didn't solve them all, but that's not what we're trying to do. We try to help you understand it. And we do that every week at World Review. Uh, thanks to all you, all of you, uh, to be part of this. And I want to thank everyone for tuning in. We'll be back next week with another edition of World Review. Until then, have a wonderful weekend. Thanks, guys.